else to wear. And I'm Wear Petsnick, um, and I'm doing this for Cleveland Decorative Arts. So we are a nonprofit organization celebrating the rich diversity of decorative art that is made, collected, and appreciated here in Cleveland, Ohio. And we have a group uh, Facebook page, um, and we also have a website. And if you could please mute your <coughs> microphone so everyone can hear, I'd really appreciate that. Okay. So when was lusterware invented? Um, it's as old as ninth, the ninth century, some of the earliest uh, ceramics that had uh, an iridescent sheen on it. Um, in Persia, and for me to do ninth century to the present in 30 minutes means we're gonna be flying. So we're gonna go rather quickly, but this is a fantastic uh, 16th century uh, Mialica dish that has a luster to it that is credited to um, a Gubbio um, ceramic artist called Giorgio Andrioli. So you should know about the existence that it happened before. But when we talk about luster wear, usually we mean a particular kind of type of wear where it's completely covered uh, or largely covered in a, a lustrous um, uh, sheen um, glaze. It's not a glaze, but um, finish. So technically luster wear is a category of ceramics that are overglazed with metals to give it an iridescent effect. The glazes are applied to the ceramic, which can be earthenware, ironstone pottern ware, uh, porcelain, creamware, pearlware. Um, the object is uh, given a second firing at lower temperatures in what's called a reduction kiln or a muffle kiln, um, which reduces the presence of oxygen. So what ends up happening is the metal um, then adheres to the surface of the ceramic. So how it's made? Well, it would have been made um, largely in and around Staffordshire in England, although there are, were other centers around Bristol, for example, or London, or up in Sunderland, Newcastle, and even as in Scotland, um, pottery kilns grew up in kind of a cottage industry basis initially, and it just kind of grew from there. So you, you'd make your pot as you would make it, even if it was not to be lustered. And then you would add a metallic clay paste over it, and then fire it again. Um, leaving only the metal shiny surface on your pot. So who invented our mm. modern version of English luster wear? Um, lots of different people have been given, given credit for it. Uh, silver luster seems to have been invented by John Hancock of Hanley, who invented the technique of adding platinum about 1800 at the Spode factory. But prior to that, um, our Frank of Brislington, which is near Bristol, was making a copper luster from about 1770. But for the most part, when you think of English luster ware, it's going to be a Victorian object um, or late Georgian. It's gonna be a 19th century object, mm -hmm. usually. Um, and the method, uh, to be a little more precise, you dissolve a powdered platinum in aqua regia, which is um, various acids, and then you add it to spirits of turpentine and um, linseed oil, if it's gold, and you put it in that reduction kiln, um, which leaves a film. And wouldn't you know, my cat has decided to join us. I do apologize. Okay, so... Who was this luster where, who made it? Who was it for? Um, on the left-hand image is um, a general store at Old Sturbridge Village, a good 19th century um, museum. And middle class or lower class customers are the ones who bought luster wear. And the image of Thomas Webster's Contrary Winds of 1843 on the right shows um, a peasant's cottage. Um, and that or a middle class or lower middle class uh, residents would be the type of people who originally bought 
these wares. Um, and even though Charles Eastlake, who wrote about um, interior decor and proper taste for the Victorian, um, he mentions luster six times, but none of it refers to English luster wear. So the assumption is that the, the great period of English luster wear pretty much had ended by about 1870, even though it was continued to be made in, in various places. But when we talk about English luster wear, um, it's pretty much, um, you know, 1810 to 1870, more or less. Dating lusterware is a really difficult um, endeavor, largely because um, maker's marks are, are usually absent. These were um, quick knockoff kind of pieces that um, in general um, did not have, they, they didn't take the effort to uh, place uh, maker's mark or a stamp on it like Wedgwood might have stamped other wares, even though he did also make um, some really beautiful and elegant late Georgian silver luster wares. So various periods of luster wear. So when you say luster wear, you know, you have to talk about the period associated with it as well as the location um, because it means different things to different people. If you say luster wear to a Renaissance historian, they're probably going to think of uh, 16th century Gubbio or Malaga, Spain made wares. Um, if you speak to a British or 18th century loving person, um, or even 19th century, you're, you're going to be talking about Staffordshire, Sunderland, or, or sometimes even in Scotland. Um, but there was a great group that was made in the 20th century as a revival, um, as well as in places like Japan, Bavaria, Czechoslovakia, those kind of places up to about the mid 20th century where it was made, but made quite differently. So we're, we're really gonna focus on the British stuff because let's face it, that's, that's what we all love. <laughs> <laughs> but I will give a nod to the other types just so you are aware of them. So here we'll get started of one of the four main types of lusterware, silver lusterware, and they would be coated in silver of the same kind of forms that you would have if it were indeed a sterling teapot, um, always emulating the elite classes, the money classes who had enough money to purchase a silver tea set. So a lot of the silver luster forms will be the same shapes as the sterling, um, but uh, much less expensive than um, the ideal. So here is um, an image from Country Life in America, 1908. Uh, showing a lot of the different forms. There, the teapot that's in the center, there's one just like that at the Victorian Albert Museum. And on the one on the far right looks rather similar to um, a spode version. Why did they make this? Um, well, it was to emulate the silver. So on the left, you see a silver luster teapot with kind of a roped or gadrooned edge. And it's rather similar to the silver teapot on the right. Um, that's what they were trying to do. But why? Ooh, it's shiny, you know, it's bling. We are fascinated as, as a being, a humanity, <laughs> by things that are shiny. And um, that goes way back to how gold, silver, and precious metals became um, yeah. desirable. Yeah. Um. Silver luster. Here are some wonderful examples from different periods showing some of the techniques used for silver luster. You either, as in the earlier versions, like the Regency time period, um, would have the whole piece covered um, with no decoration. Um, and here you have examples of a silver resist where basically, um, uh, something is painted on to the china blank um, that has already been fired and has probably a leaden glaze of some sort. And when the, um, 
the mixture, the clay paste that has metals in it is um, laid over that and fired, the metal doesn't adhere to the place where you painted on the pattern. Does that make sense? Hopefully it does. Um, so you get things through through different periods. On the left is a uh, Wedgwood D. Ken um, kind of hunting uh, picture, which was very popular mid 20th century. Um, you see this in loads of different examples, and it was all about John Peel in England. Uh, in the middle is a candlestick with a beautiful Georgian um, uh, decorative scheme. That's by Wedgwood. Top right, um, a mixture of the silver resist as well as some hand painting in the little lozenge. You'd also see um, pictures like that, that instead of having that um, hand painted um, castle, uh, you would have a transfer printed image of a house or some kind of commemorative um, historical event. And then the bottom right is a Gibbons 1905 little teapot also using the same technique. And here is, is one of the earliest versions of the silver luster that you might be able to find out there. An 1810 spode uh, teapot at the Victorian Albert Museum. So this was designed to trick people, which if you saw it at a great distance when it was new, it, it probably did a fair, fair job in um, fooling a passerby that you had a silver tea set. But reality is that if you picked it up, you would know, or touched it, you would know instantly that it was not cold as silver. It would be a warmer um, feeling. You, you would know instantly it wasn't sterling silver. Um, and this sort of thing continued and was, was relatively popular for the growing middle classes who began to have money ex until the, um, the rise of electroplating. And um, Thomas Bolsover invented Old Sheffield Plate in 1742, but that really didn't get going until later in the 18th century. And certainly by say 1840 after the Elkingtons developed an electroplated process. You know, that was pretty much the death knell for the main period of silver luster. Silver luster, a really great site. I hope you guys um, go to Colonial Williamsburg site and look for this teapot. Just go to Colonial Williamsburg and search for Silver Luster, and you will find this. It's fantastic. They've got tons of photos which show all kind of angles of this teapot. And it's really interesting to see the interior that shows the red earthenware that never got that um, platinum coating. Here is another one, um, a luster little creamer about 1825, where because it was something that could be seen more readily, um, they would put the silver on the inside of the creamer as well. Is that teapot on there? Is that luster? Other, sorry, other silver luster items like this uh, per defume. You learn so many things when you do a program like this. I loved researching it. Perdifume is, anyone guess? <laughs> it's designed to go over a gas light and it should have like most of them by uh, Bailey and Watkin will have a ceramic cone upon which this globe and resting lion um, sits. And it was designed to to collect gas fumes and vapors off of a gas light. And it was patented 1824. So this version on the right is probably 1824, 25, about that period. So here's another one, um, which shows the conical shape that's at um, an antique dealer, johnhoward.co.uk. So, is it still being made today? Well, yes, you know, the, if you talk about plated um, 
embellished ceramics, yes, you can still get fabulous porcelain dinner plates with platinum on it. This is a French version um, that's quite fabulous. But is that lusterware? Mm, you, I, I would say no. Even though technically it's following the same definition, it's it's not lusterware. It's an embellished. It's an embellished dinner plate as opposed to lusterware that really was the main um, the main characteristic of an object that happened to be ceramic. That's my humble opinion um, oh. as a term. Here is a Wedgwood resist in both the silver, um, which brought into the 20th century, as well as the pink. Now, silver is not made of silver. As you know, it's, it's made of a platinum ground up um, in the process, but pink is actually gold. So all that shines isn't silver. In this case, the pink is gold. Same kind of process as uh, cranberry glass. Cranberry glass is made um, with gold, makes it red, um, makes glass red. So in when gold is introduced to ceramics like this, it turns a rosy kind of pinkish color. And here are two, I think, wonderful um, little jugs, pitchers made in pink luster. On the left, um, Newcastle, circa 1820. Um, it is kind of like that head Wedgwood de Yaken pitcher of the mid 20th century uh, with a molded handle and kind of a raised relief um, hunting scene uh, on the main body of the pitcher. And on the right um, is a Sunderland example about the same time, 1820, that has a transfer of the bridge uh, over the river by Sunderland. So these are very representative of the type of pink luster that you get from Northern England in the earlier years of the 19th century. And here's another really good example, the strawberry pattern, um, probably from Sunderland, and um, the, the pink kind of lustrous finish um, would be added. This would have been part of a tea set. A lot of times these luster wares, um, the forms revolve around the service of tea. There are other focuses as well for luster wear from Staffordshire figures and objects like the Mary Atwood charming little tiger that's at the Metropolitan Museum of Art on the left. And on the right, um, there's also a great group of, of plaques with um, that would probably um, fall under a moonlight luster wear category. Uh, where the splatter wear and splash wear would be incorporated with um, his, with um, important scenes or religious uh, encouraging quotations, uh, faith, hope, and charity, um, or important historical events also would be found on those kind of plaques. This Chelsea grape, which looks purple, it doesn't really look pink, is still categorized as a pink luster because the um, there are highlights of pink over to pick out the raised decoration. In this, in this case, it's Chelsea grape. Um, there are other Chelsea patterns which have nothing to do with Chelsea, England. That's just the name of the pattern. Um, it's also sometimes known as grandmother's pattern. And you'd see this in all sorts of different forms of teapots and kettles. So this is a little later, about 1830, um, maybe as late as 1840. So another aspect or type of lusterware is called moonlight lusterware. And I'm hoping some of you may correct me if I'm wrong. I was trying to find a clear definition of what this is, but I think what it is, is when the potters like after hours were moonlighting, 
um, they would get experimental with their decorations of the pots. So things like the splatterware and the splashware in pink luster and, and other metals thrown in. Um, obviously this might have a little gold in it as well as the, um, uh, the pink and the kind of purple tones. I think that was an experiment after hours kind of thing that they were moonlighting. I, I could never find an accurate description of it anywhere. So um, just know that ceramics of this type look like that and are called moonlight luster wear. Um, there's a great example of it on the left, uh, a wonderful shell at the Metropolitan Museum. And I think this is a Wedgwood candlestick in the middle and the picture on the far right. So these would fall under the earlier period of luster wear, English luster wear, which would be probably before 1830. I'd, I'd probably say even before that, before 1820 even. But again, these things are hard to date because they don't have date codes and they don't usually have maker's marks. Copper luster, um, like this image from a sale at Bonhams, is of this type is pretty much all of it mid 19th century. But there can be some zingers that you throw in there that you think it's a certain date and then you find another example that is dated and um, you realize that you need to correct your captions. Um, I'll explain that in, in just a second. But Copper Lester uh, has the same kind of forms that you would find on any other kind of 19th century ceramic. Um, it's just that they happen to be decorated a little differently. Okay. On the left, you find um, Faith where you've got the Holy Bible on the left, um, a figure of faith, the personification of faith, um, holding a cross. And on the right, that funny little pedestal with the smoke coming out, that in fact is um, a censer with incense billowing up into heaven. So you, a lot of times in the 19th century, those kind of faith, hope, and charity images would be reproduced on domestic wares of this type. On the right is an example by Enoch Wood. Now, Enoch Wood occupied the Burselm works in Staffordshire after Wedgwood did. So um, if you hadn't heard of Enoch Wood, he did the types of wares that you see on the right-hand side and also followed very closely in, some, in the footsteps of Wedgwood and the advantages that he and his firm made in the science of ceramics. When I said copper luster is very difficult to date, um, I wasn't kidding. On the left, I thought that that little cup uh, was, you know, mid, mid 19th century like the rest of it. Well, in fact, it's not. Um, as, it, as one of the few things that bears a mark of Allerton's of Longton, England, and that dates from about 1915 to 1945, yeah. which surprises me because it's a very delicate and kind of refined object um, that they carried on. They were one of the few makers in the UK that carried on producing copper luster ware into the 20th century in the same manner as it had been done in the 19th. On the right is a cup that is 1840 with a hand painted surface decoration. As you see comparing between the two, um, they have similar bases and they have this very distinctive beaded work around the rim. So it makes dating these things extremely difficult. Lots of different forms of copper luster. You let, I, I put a little Duracell battery there to give you a basic um, uh, scale for these items. On the left, a master salt. Um, in the middle, a mustard pot. And on the right, um, that same small cup. Is that and copper? most. Hey, John, do you mind muting your mic? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, here is 
a fantastic, unusual Scottish copper luster teapot and creamer. Um, they produced this about 1860 in Rutherglen, which is near Glasgow. So it wasn't just the English makers doing copper luster. It was also found in Scotland. Um, and they were the very distinctive firm doing this kind of eagle handle. Another tea set here, which I thought was about 1850 is actually earlier than that, based upon the shape of the teapot, sugar and creamer with the um, tea mare mogul scenery transfer wear teapot that can be dated because it did have a mark on it. And it's, you can see it's clear, very clearly, it's the same shape pot. It's just de decorated in a different method. So that's 1826 to 1835. And you see again in some of the early um, magazines that covered the collecting of lusterware. At the top is um, a collection of a lady in Salem, Massachusetts, that was kind of a purple, a puce pink luster. Um, again, exact same, same body, same shapes. So luster was made in many different forms. Um, if it was made in Staffordshire in porcelain, creamware, pearlware, earthenware, redware, ironstone, then it could also be finished in luster. It was just whatever they chose to embellish with a little bling. Um, they produced spice boxes, which is that fantastic image in the middle. Uh, if you are out shopping and you ever find one, please buy it for me <laughs> or tell me where I can get it because uh, it would be astonishing to find such a rare early silver luster object like that. Um, they also had the perfumes and the pepper pots and the goblets and mustard pots, etc. So there are lots of different, um, lots of different forms. On the right is a little waste or sometimes called a slop bowl used um, when you're removing the, um, the, the tea leaves. Um, from the coffee top, from the teapot. Here's a little cup, um, a goblet from around 1830 with banded decoration and a little bit of uh, beading around the top rim. So on the right is a little Staffordshire um, molded decoration and raised relief on the, the main band of the body, um, which is very similar to what they call a Capo de Monte style copper luster jug on the left, where they pick out um, uh, the raised relief in color, like the Naples um, ceramic factory in Italy. The various techniques in making luster wear. So here you can see it's very clearly and simply a lot of the decoration that is hand done after a couple of firings to produce the, the, the luster finish. Then after that, they would go over it and then paint um, usually a floral or foliate type of decoration or just a simple band or series of bands. A lot of these techniques, whether it, the object was dipped fully um, inside and out, whether it was molded or thrown on a wheel, um, whether it had resist decoration, banded, transfer printing, bat printing, hand painted overlay, modeled or sanded, all of these different techniques um, could also be combined. So these tend to be the main the main types of decoration or the methods in used in producing luster wear. Um, I mentioned bat print and I wanted to know more about this so I looked into it and bat printing is a very specific time frame of a type of transfer of an engraving. So you find Adam Buck, who was an English, or sorry, an Irish artist who did a lot of portraiture, society portraiture in London um, in the late Georgian period. And his engravings 
would be inked and then a piece of silk cloth would be laid over the inked design and then that was then transferred onto your ceramic pot. Um, this was a very expensive and imprecise uh, labor intensive uh, process. So this did not last long and transfer printing um, really shifted more to the type of blue and white china and the blue willow and things like that that you see which were transfer printed using a, a paper kind of process where the image was put on paper and then um, at uh, a paper and then added to the pot. But it's quite interesting, once you start to look for Adam Buck prints, you see them everywhere. On the left um, is a lady reclining on her chaise longue. Uh, she looks very much like Elizabeth Bennet in Pride of Prejudice. Um, and on the little teacup and saucer, you see her again. And um, Enoch Wood uh, pictures also have this exact same image. Um, it's a it's uh, much loved and often used image that was added to porcelain through the bat printing process. Collecting lusterware. So I don't know if any of you recognize Mario Batata, the king of chins, but interior designers and early magazines of the 20th century kind of created an allure and a cult and inspired a popularity for collecting lusterware. Uh, so on the left from the delineator of 1905, you see tons of teapots crammed into this um, broken swan neck pediment corner cupboard. Um, the collector's manual going through all the different types of lusterware and the forms and what to look out for and um, it was it was really um, quite uh, quite a movement if you will uh, within decorator decorating and antique collecting circles at the beginning of the 20th century to embrace this what they thought was a colonial object, but of course it wasn't colonial at all. <laughs> it didn't really exist until after we became an independent nation. Um, interesting also, some of the magazines encouraged in 1921, bottom right, the Ladies Home Journal, they sold um, transfer patterns so you could add the copper luster design to your own china blanks. So it was kind of an extension of, of China painting, but they, they were in copper luster and um, you, you can buy them from Lady Some Journal. Sale catalogs too, like in the right, the Walpole Gallery sale of April 1916 in New York, not to pick on the Walpole, Walpole Galleries, but to say it's English luster from the colonial and later periods, um, I think you should emphasize later periods because they didn't do it during the, the colonial time. It's very much a Victorian 19th century process. And on the left is an example, if you remember that strawberry Sunderland pink luster little dish, um, there's two cups and saucers like it in that strawberry pattern that came from the collection of Mario Boada. So, um, Sale catalogs also created a, an allure for um, collecting lust, English lusterware because of various collections. Lusterware like that spice box, um, silver overlay or silver resist over a chrome yellow base is highly sought after, as well as for some reason, and I've never quite understood why this is, but one of the most expensive uh, copper luster objects out there is a Cornwallis, what they call a Cornwallis jug. And it depicts Cornwallis on one side and Lafayette on the other. Um, and that's shown on the right. But I don't know if you can see, 
but the the transfer is is hardly legible in some places that it's worn off so collecting luster wear condition is is an important thing to watch out for because particularly in a lot of those copper pitcher copper luster pictures or or jugs they're missing um, there are a lot of chips particularly on the spouts um, but one good thing about some of these chips is that you can actually see what the body of the ceramic is, whether it's a lighter earthenware mm. or a darker redware, as you see on the right. And I'm not sure when we got started, but lusterware in the 20th century looks like this. This is Japanese occupied Japan peach from 22 to 47 by Noritake. Similar work in Bavaria in the 1940s with that um, kind of peachy, actually it was probably the 30s, um, peach and black and very art deco. And then strangely, this whole body of work here was done in Abingdon, Virginia in the 1940s. Um, I had no idea that this sort of thing existed, but Combo um, did a lot of the copper luster painting you see there, as well as patented a particular tea leaf motif with the U.S. Patent Office. Tea leaf ironstone is a copper luster. Um, it was decorated initially in England, but then producers also made it here as well, owing to its popularity. So there was a time, I remember as a child, going to antique shops or antique fairs where you couldn't go to one without seeing some example of tea leaf. It, it, was, it was everywhere. It was a big craze of people collecting it. And there was an International Tea Leaf Association, which Dale Abrams so kindly on the right um, allowed me to use this image of the various types of motif that you'd find on tea leaf china. So thank you, Dale. Also, you'd find tea leaf where it's a china blank, like here an ironstone little dish from Johnson Brothers was decorated by Cumbo here in this country, owing to the popularity of colonial revivalism. Um, Luster versus luster, obviously luster, R-E, is a British spelling. So if you are a collector and you are searching for this, it's really important that you use both terms because uh, they're used often interchangeably. So I think I probably went a little over 30 minutes. I do apologize, but I'm hoping that CDM members will um, somehow vote and let us know what the next program will be February 16th at noon, and hopefully we will get our links right.